uh, you know, write this address and send one dollar for the best punk, oi, ska, hardcore, and SXE. And I was like, what the fuck is SXE? Do they misspell sex? You know, I'm a child. I'm a child. I'm super horny. Everything in my brain is going. Yeah, you're like, I need to know more. (laughs) Yes. And so I'm like, I got a dollar. What is up, my friends? Thanks again for tuning in. This is the Scoped Exposure Podcast. Um, I, I'm sure people who have been listening to the show for a long time know that I'm a very big uh, Stick to Your Guns fan. Uh, we've had a few members of the show. Uh, we've had Chris. We've had Jesse. We've had um, Josh, too. And, you know, it would feel incomplete if we didn't have Josh 1 on the podcast as well. Um, Josh has been someone that I've really wanted to have for a long time just because, again, following his bands, but also just kind of like seeing just like the personality that he brings to the band and and just his musicianship as well has been something i've been admiring and now we're finally here so josh james of stick your guns 18 visions and sorry fern on the fucking scoped exposure podcast what's up how you doing good (laughs) i have have a question for you who's josh who's josh one josh one is you but you said you had josh one on the podcast and i'm josh two or you had josh two I had mean Josh Adam? too. Oh, who's Josh too? <laughs> I think I I think I did get my um my things uh confused here. You know, no, like, I'm gonna start call. I'm gonna start calling Adam Josh too. Okay, to, okay, to drive him insane. I mean, like, if we're being honest, I think Stick Your Guns has always been a band with um you know level one white guy names. Is that fair to say? Very, very true. Which is interesting because <laughs> Adam's Mexican, but it's still a level one white guy name. Right. <laughs> That's very true as well. So he slides into that. Yeah. Jesse's even quarter Mexican, and he also has level one entry okay. white guy name. <laughs> well, Adam, I, I have to apologize right out the get go. I, uh, I think. No, I don't like, apologize to him. No. <laughs> well, um, Josh Wan, the one and only. Um, dude, I'm very excited to be having you on. Um, there's a lot of really exciting things uh, that I want to talk to you about. Uh, got a, a couple surprises as well, uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit later. But anytime uh, someone comes on the podcast, we have to start off with a Bev check. Um, so you got a mug, but I don't know what's in said mug. So tell me what's uh, in the mix. Ginger, ginger tea inside my um, fake FBI mug. Because oh. I used to, I used to really enjoy um, impersonating an FBI agent for discounts at uh, overpriced restaurants and places around my home, mm. and it, it would drive my wife uh, into a panic because naturally <laughs> she figured I'd get arrested for it. So yeah, so uh, it's a it's a nice hot ginger tea. Mm. Are you uh, a pretty avid tea drinker, or you're kind of like a little <clears throat> special? treat for you yourself today i I go through i go through phases Mm -hmm. but yeah i don't i don't drink coffee oh like never at all no Mm. never do you have like the extra x for uh for you know caffeine no coffee i mean i will i'll take the extra x uh (laughs) i do consume i do consume caffeine i just think coffee tastes like shit which i'm sure i'm gonna get a whole bunch of hate for that and before anybody says anything, before they go, well, you haven't tried the fucking, you know, blueberry vanilla coffee from Ethiopia that's available at Blue Bottle. I have. Because every <laughs> time we're on tour, Adam and Jesse and Andrew are huge coffee heads. So every time they're like, oh, my God, the nodes of this is absolutely wonderful. I'm like, let me get a sip. And then I'm like, it is not for me. I would, I hear, and here's the truth. I would love to love coffee. It seems mm. like it really brings everybody together. It's your conversational piece backstage or whatever, but my taste buds just don't like it. 
Yeah, you can't. Well, you know, sometimes you can't. You can't really fix that. You know, you it's can't. not like you've done your exposure to it, but it's just it's not it's not for you. I've tried. I've tried to expose myself to coffee, and it didn't work. What's the the caffeine uh, of choice for you then? Is it like energy drinks? Is it oh you know, no mate? No, we're going uh, Red Can Original All American Coca Cola. Oh okay, <laughs> that's that's what I'm doing. Oh. And then outside of that, the the um, I guess the like hip beverage that I fuck with a lot is uh, matcha latte. Oh, okay. matcha latte sweetened oat milk. That's uh, that's my that's, that's my very move. close to um. I, I was just in the mountains um because I'm I'm from Alberta and uh, me mm-hmm. and my wife hit a coffee spot on the way back and she had uh matcha latte oat milk with honey so pretty much the the same thing that uh, that's the move yeah that's the move um so I'm drinking um I'm gonna be drinking I've been on uh having some like healthy sodies uh in the fridge so I'm gonna be drinking an Olipop. Uh, I had one at the those are uh, probiotic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had um, I can't remember what the flavor was. I think it was like their fruit punch flavor I had um for our last episode, and then this one I'm doing their strawberry vanilla. So um, Good I'm already kind of jittering, so I need to like something that's like just subtle when it comes to kind of keeping me at bay. <clears throat> Soda always calms you down. Yeah. Um. Well, dude, I'm really excited to finally do this with you. Cheers. Cheers. Tea, tea, and uh, and a little healthy soda. Yeah, we're What's responsible that? adults. <laughs> we gotta be. That's actually very. It's like it's kind of like a. <clears throat> uh, it's got like a. No, it is it, a feeling of like a popsicle as a drink, but not like super sugary. That Strawberry vanilla. vanilla? Hmm. Mm. I had to go for a second. Interesting. Second. Cool. As good as the first? Uh, just as reliable. There we go. There we go. All right, Josh. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, so anytime uh, someone's newer here on the show, if it's their first time, because some people come from like a, a part two interview or things like that, I always start off kind of with <laughs> the same question. Um, how originally did you find out about hardcore? What kind of a – what – was the thing or the riff or the band that kind of put you on the path um, to kind of bring bring us to this moment? Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, what's what's your origin story for that? I definitely found it through punk music. Um, like in the third grade, uh, I had saved up like three dollars, and my mom was taking me to the uh, like a secondhand store, like kind of like a uh, Salvation Army type store to <clears throat> shop for clothes. And I found this shirt with this giant skull on it. And I was like, skulls are cool. I'm a child. Death rocks. (laughs) And uh, so I was like, I'm going to buy this. I didn't know what it was. And, you know, it turns out it was the the Crimson Ghost Misfits. But it didn't say Misfits anywhere on the shirt. Mm. And um, I was just sort of wearing the shirt. It was my favorite shirt. My mom absolutely hated it. She threatened to spray paint the skull pink. Um, but it was like, I bought this with my own $3. Uh, you can't, you have no control over this. And so um, anyway, some kid from the neighborhood was like, oh, you like the Misfits? And I was like, I don't know what that is. And then I ended up getting like a, just like a, I guess you call it a burned tape and um, a cassette tape. And then that had Misfits on it. And I thought it was awesome because they're talking about teenagers from Mars and all this stuff that I can really visualize. But I'm in the third or fourth grade. I don't really care that much about music. So it's like I have, I'm listening to Misfits. I'm listening to Millie Vanilli. I'm listening to MC Hammer. And I'm listening to Aerosmith. Like those are my, that's my tape collection. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really care that much about music. Um, And then around the sixth grade, my mom came to my brother and, and, uh, and me and said, you guys have to learn how to play an instrument, which was kind of bizarre for my mom because she was, if she's watching this, I had no beef with you, mom, but it was more, it was more like, it was more like a uh, prison warden, uh, you know, uh, situation. She wasn't someone that was always like super trying to get me to play sports or do a bunch of stuff. That's what I mean by that. It was mostly just like be responsible, do your chores. And if you don't, 
you didn't get a whooping. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but when she came to us, she was like, learn how to play uh, an instrument. And I was like, well, I want to play the guitar, the drums. And she's like, you should play the saxophone. And I was like, oh, I'll for sure get my ass kicked <laughs> if I start playing the saxophone. So she went out, we went to a pawn shop, she bought me a guitar. And it's probably the coolest thing that my mom's ever done in my entire life because it really did unknowingly set me on this trajectory to, uh, you know, to where I am now. Right. And um, so that was like the sixth grade. And I think by then I started listening to, I started to actually listen to music. And when I was in the sixth grade, this is when like Nirvana's popping off, Green Day Dookie comes out, uh, Weezer Blue. So I'm listening to a lot of that along with bands like Rancid and No Effects and Fat Record stuff. And through that, you know, um, through that and skateboarding, it's kind of, you make friends skating and then everybody's like, do you know this band, you know that band. And um, through that, I, I started learning about bands like Minor Threat and Black Flag, Youth of Today. But I was completely unaware that those were hardcore bands. Mm-hmm. To me at the time, I was like, yeah, that's like old school punk. It's like 80s punk music, you know? And it wasn't until, and also because the town that I grew up in, I was unaware of any type of like, hardcore or metal like scene it was just punk and different you know different genres of punk um so it wasn't probably until i was like 15 or 16 oh no 14 or 15 um there was a label out of sweden i believe called burning heart and they they had a uh that was really common back then is for labels to do compilation cds and that way you could kind of like check out all the bands that were on the label. And then, you know, if you liked one, you'd go buy the record and you try to go to the show or whatever. Right. And also on most of these compilations on the back, there would be a mailing address to send like one or two dollars and they would send you a catalog. And it said, um, uh, you know, write this address and send one dollar for the best punk, oi, ska, hardcore and SXE. And I was like, what the fuck is SXE? Do they misspell sex? You know, I'm a child. I'm a child. I'm super horny. Everything in my brain is going. Yeah, you're direction. like, I need to know more. Yes. And so I'm like, I got a dollar. And uh, and so, you know, then I find out, oh, that's that is the way that straight edge is abbreviated. And then I realized, like, oh, that's what minor threats talking about. That's not just a song, that's right. actually like a, a lifestyle. And because of that, I somehow stumbled upon strife and earth crisis Mm -hmm. and so those were my two bands that took me into like um what i viewed definitely then as hardcore so took me into screaming music you know and um and so at that point you know that's that's right around the time that that i became straight edge and then i started um listening to more and more hardcore and and metalcore music and stuff like that. That's also, you know, at this point I'm now in like 10th or 11th grade. I've been in a ton of local bands since like the seventh grade and they were all some version of punk. And then this is when me and some friends started a band called Evergreen Terrace. Right. Um, So this is all like like in, in the Florida like region. Yeah. Yeah. This is all, um, you know, around and in and around, uh, Jacksonville, Florida. So North Florida, you could argue Southern Georgia if you wanted to, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's all, all around there. So this is like late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah. Yeah. And it's crazy to hear some of those kind of moments of like it in the, in the, the short form or the, the, the minute version of it, it, it just seems like, Oh, like I want, josh to play saxophone but it seems like he really wants to get a guitar so let's at least go and look and then you know like i i I can't imagine a josh james that plays sax in a you know professionally and touring around the world world and doing all those things so man i would now i'm like fuck it'd be so sick if i could rip a saxophone also (laughs) just like be at a party like you know my the same thing happened with my brother he's four years younger than me and she tried to make him play to learn the keyboard, which again, now as an adult, it'd be awesome to be able to sit behind a piano and just shred at the airport or whatever. Right. And he was like, no, I want to play drums. Right. And then he ended up playing drums in Casey Jones 
and a few other bands. So we actually ended up playing in bands together and touring, which, which actually was really cool. And, and, you know, I think about that a lot. Um, you know, that, you know, that wasn't my mom's intention, but what, like, what a, what a beautiful thing to come out of her. You know, she, for some reason had this intuition of like, Oh, they need to play an instrument. And, and mm-hmm. that's, that's really cool. Yeah. And it's definitely like something that's e- even in a, an alternate timeline where it's just, <clears throat> you know, shitting around in some garage stuff like those memories are still going to be, those memories would still be something that, you know, you guys and, uh, she would be able to hold on to is like, oh, that was like, you know, a really special time. But it's almost amplified off the fact that you guys have done festivals and toured around the world to- together. And like, um, you know, I- I've listened in past interviews where it's like um, y- your parents have gone to see you play a, a few times, but not a- like off of the amount of times that they could. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I think it's, that there, it's was a, there was a gap in one interview where you're like the last time it was it was like an ever, evergreen Terra show and then and then recently it was like five years ago it was like a stig show yeah yeah i think the i think that the only shows that my mom and stepdad have ever seen who you know that's what i was like primarily raised by was the first evergreen terrace record release show mm-hmm. so that's like maybe like 2000 but i started playing in bands and like i started playing shows in 95 Right. So in like 2000, they went to a show and then they went to a stick to your guns show. They went and saw us play welcome to Rockville, like 2018. So <laughs> massive gap, but right. I will say <clears throat> they were always totally fine and cool with uh, all the bands that I was in anytime that we needed to practicing in my bedroom. So bedroom. they probably, <laughs> They probably, uh, yeah, we'd set up the drums, everything. There'd be like an amp on top of the bed. Everyone just crammed in there. And, that, and back then, that's how we would write music. Mm-hmm. So if I had a song or a riff, I mean, those poor people, my mom and stepdad, they would just be, you know, we didn't have a giant house. They would right. be sitting on the other side of the house, but we're talking maybe 80 feet away, right. just hearing the same bad 15-year-old riff being played over and over and over for hours so they've definitely did their time like actually having to sonically listen Mm -hmm. to what i was doing and i remember my mom would be like can't you guys just play something different you're playing the same you know over and over like that's how we get the song right mom so (laughs) that's probably why now that i think about it you know i'm having this realization right now that's probably why they weren't super amped to go to a bunch of shows because they yeah. were probably like oh thank god they're not inside that bedroom right now <laughs> yeah that's you know? like they're so, you know they get the um the the front row seats um at times and seeing the you know all the unpolished bits of a show um but you know obviously it's a 90 day difference definitely um i want to fast forward to um to when you actually kind of you know evergreen terrace is like you know a whole uh venture that we could go down but i want to th- there's more current day stuff that i want to hit and um when it comes to stick to your guns like sure. i heard in a past interview i was like <clears throat> someone asked you about how you met the guys and the answer you gave i was like i i don't know if this is cap because you started with do you want the real answer or a fake answer and then you said the real answer, but I feel like if you said, oh, the real answer is I would have just believed it. But I feel like there's a small element of doubt. So and this could just be. A what one-off. was the what was the answer you heard? The answer was that you water ballooned them at a Star Wars convention and then you met up at a pizza place later. That is that true? Yeah, here's the thing. Like and again, just like coffee, I'm probably going to get a lot of heat for this. <laughs> Not a Star Wars fan. Mm-hmm. So, you know, especially at that time in my life, I'm like, look at these nerds. <laughs> and I got all these water balloons. And so just whop them, you know? And then fast forward over a decade later, they're, you know, some of my best friends. Yeah. So you, so it was at a convention, then you guys just ran into each other later and it's like, oh yeah, I play in this band. And, you know, did you sing, single them out because they had like the hardcore shirts and shit like that on, or were they just at the right place Maybe. at the right time? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Everything happens for a reason. That's true. It's very, very true. 
Um, the other stick to your guns thing that I want to hit on with you is um, you guys are very notorious for having um, a lot of van woes on a lot of tours. And I feel like your um, narration through the struggle is, uh, is almost comedic at times. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask you, have there been any times where in your experiences you've called some kind of van trouble before it's even happened? Yeah. I mean, I think the reason for the, the comedic response is typically is because if you look at a tragedy enough, it's really a comedy <laughs> and it's just, sometimes you wonder whatever God or entity is in control of this universe if they're just having a grand old laugh at stick to your guns expense, specifically with trailers and vans. Mm -hmm. um, I've never called like, this is what's going to happen, but we've definitely before tours been like, all right, let's play some bets. How many times is something going to go wrong? You know, transportation wise. And uh, what's, what's funny is like, it extends far beyond, um, <clears throat> Fans and trailers like we have had some horrific comedic experiences in Europe with buses, things with planes. I think I've been and we're just ready to punch it. That even you know goes down to my I take that into my our, all of our personal lives as well, where you know some there was a time where Jesse was coming to practice and all of a sudden his brakes gave out. And then he was like, well, I'll just change my brakes on the side of the road. You know, it's just, <laughs> you kind of just figure out how, how to roll with the punches, but uh, yeah, it's a goddamn mess, you know, <laughs> but the, 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 the good thing about it is luckily knock on wood, everything has just been like an insane, weird situation like one time we're driving through the middle of nowhere iowa chris is driving and then he goes i think we have a flat tire and we pull over and we have four flat tires and we're like, <laughs> how did you not notice this right. and somehow luckily through anything that's ever happened we've never had like you know major accidents that's that's caused like actual sure. like you know physical trauma or, you know, anything like that. So we're, we're very lucky for that. I think that's also why we can laugh about it because we know it could be a lot, a lot worse. For sure. Yeah. And, and some, and that's definitely the attitude you need to take. Cause like, yeah, like even when it's like the shit is hitting the fans so hard and it's spraying right into your face, it could always be worse. So. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was, um, in 2022, we did a tour with Pennywise and Rise Against <clears throat> And we were headed to Winnipeg, and then that's when we were told the show has been canceled because the storm of the century has hit Winnipeg. Right. So now the show's canceled, and we have, I think, one or two days off to get to Calgary or Edmonton, yeah. somewhere around there. So we're cutting through the Dakotas, and I'm driving, and all of a sudden we hit, like, the gnarliest windstorm I've ever – like, it was – fucking unreal i didn't know wind could move that fast and i look in the rearview mirror and i'm like something's wrong we pull over we get out it's like we're like ah! and we get to the uh trailer and the trailer is being ripped apart by the wind like it's just peeling and, going, and so oh we're just like you're just screaming but it's like nothing we can do about it so we just keep driving and then it's just you know constantly things just kept happening and happening and happening but it's just it's kind of comedic and i think we also just take it as at that point it's a challenge of like can we make it to the show <laughs> and i don't i don't know if we've ever actually missed a show because of because of that i think we've always found a way mm -hmm. which you know, and sometimes you get there and you're like, wow, this show sucks. We should <laughs> we have just have stayed on the show. side of the road and got a, got a hotel. We could have just missed this mental beating, but you know, that's, uh, that's, that's, we don't go on tour to not play shows. So, right. I think that, um, that experience that you were mentioning, um, cause, uh, I grew up in Winnipeg, uh, but I live in Calgary now. And I think I remember 
some of those shows were getting so m- messed up. And I think the Edmonton show also canceled. So I remember Chris was texting me and we were trying to set up a last minute show. And then like you guys ended up getting a venue and it was, I, I remember I was, yeah, at, we made it. We oh, made it just, to Calgary. Yeah. And uh, the show was crazy. Mm-hmm. And Rise Against was like, you guys think that's crazy? Just wait till tomorrow for the Edmonton show. And we're like, hell yeah. Wake up the next morning, there's a text from their team that's like, show's canceled. Somebody in Rise Against has COVID. And we're just like, <laughs> oh. But then we ended up doing a last minute show, Us and Pennywise. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was it was really cool. It was yeah. really cool. Yeah, I remember Chris was uh, messaging and I, I was at a, um, like a, like a green space with my my wife and she was like getting stuff and I'm like sending these texts with him back and forth and there was a slight sliver of possibility that you know before Pennywise was like we're also going to do a show where it sounds like it was going to be a a super DIY stick your gun style yeah like in some bar or something like that yeah Yeah. exactly yeah you know I'm happy that you guys still got to play a show but I feel like the um the alternate timeline where it's like you know a hundred person venue and just packed filled filled with people would have been fucking sick um i mean that's that's realistically what we would prefer but unfortunately (laughs) gas is so expensive that those shows you just end up losing money now so right 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 um so speaking of dope shows um it's been a while because six year guns is like a a machine that seems to always be moving with different tours and, and different things but um you guys doing the diamond tour very recently um Obviously, that was a very pivotal record for me when I was like first discovering you guys. So I guess I wanted to pick your brain if there was any like highlights from that tour or just like, you know, people coming up to you as far as like what that record meant to them and and this, that or the other. Yeah, you know, I I think like we we did, um, you know, a diamond tour in North America, Mexico, Europe, UK, Australia and um Southeast Asia. Yeah. And so pretty much covered the the world. The only place that we really didn't hit was um, South America. Mm. And um, I think like halfway through that, uh, Jesse made the comment a few times from stage that it was like, it really is really humbling and, and flattering to hear how many people People would come up to us and be like, this record got me through this tough time or this record's what like got me into hardcore. And, you know, like you guys were a gateway band for me or, or whatever it is. But this record means a lot, uh, a lot to, to the people that were, were telling us about it. And that was a moment where we realized like, oh, man, this record did more for us as individuals than it probably did for anybody else, because this this that record was the vehicle that allowed us to to really build like um a rad fan base and to continue that you know now 10 12 years later after that record so we're we're all extremely thankful for just that existing and i don't think at the time when it was being written anyone was trying to write like trying to write the the record or whatever it was a lot of just like right time, right place, right sound, right feelings, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's, I think that's the beauty about just music in general is that whenever people are writing honest shit, um, that if it happens to come out of that time where other people are feeling those same things or can relate to those same things, then it really does have, have, have a cool impact. And so we're super thankful on it, but I mean, all the shows were, were surprisingly awesome. I thought they all did, um, I think the energy there was really special Mm. and it's been a while since we had done a tour that felt like that. And it was also really cool because there's a few songs off that record that we've consistently played for the last decade, but there's, there's, I think like three songs that we've never played on a tour. Maybe we've played a couple of times at a show, Mm -hmm. uh, at random shows, but we've never put it in a set list on tour. So that was actually really cool and kind of surprising because I'm sure most people in bands would understand this is like, sometimes you go, Oh, I know the crowd won't like this band or won't like this song. 
Yeah. So let's not even bother playing it. Or do you play it once or once or twice and the crowd doesn't react the way that you're hoping for? So you're like, never mind, it's a fucking dud. Mm-hmm. But to be able to come back and then all of a sudden play on this anniversary tour and you see people, you know, bucking out over it, it was cool. Which songs were those, if you don't mind me asking? Um, Ring Loud okay. was one. Um, buh, 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 I don't even know the names of the songs. Um, Beyond the Sun mm-hmm. is another. Um, and then songs that we hadn't played in a long time was Life, like Life in a Box, um, I Am... Mm-hmm. Uh, built upon the sand, so it had been a long time since we played so, yeah, those lots songs. Of stuff off of uh, the B side of the record. Yeah, totally, yeah. Cool. totally. Yeah, that's that's honestly a perfect um, uh, transition into my next question. And I asked, um, you know, all the other guys from the band, um, but I always like to ask this question. And this doesn't have to be on Diamond specifically, but I like I like to ask this question for people that have a large discography behind them. So. In your opinion, Josh, what is the most underrated Stick to Your Gun song? And what is the most overrated Stick to Your Gun song? Oh, my God. And again, um, this is your perspective because you're coming from the guitarist and backup vocal um, angle while, you know, the drums or the vocal side of things could be completely different. That's hard to pinpoint just one song. Um, maybe but you got multiple. multiple? <laughs> oh yeah, I got like whole records. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the most over. I think the mo- most overrated song. Oh, dude, this sounds so bad because it's it's not like I don't like the song, but I think. Mm, Nah, yeah, like, like for know. the for the listeners, like overrated doesn't mean it's a bad song, but it's like w- I'm playing this for the people. Like I just have to kind of strum along for you know. It's that 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 changes for a long time. That was we still believe, mm-hmm. and then when we started playing it on this diamond tour, it was because we hadn't been playing it for years. That were like, yeah, this song's this song rocks. There was also a time where Amber felt like it was. Like, oh, we're playing this one again. And there's also times where it felt like um, uh, against them all was like, okay, here we go. We have to play it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But I also recognize like those are all great live songs and people love them. And and I genuinely do whenever we start playing, I'm like, oh yeah, this part, I like this part a lot, you know? Right. Um, But underrated, I mean, that's hard because I think there's songs that, there's songs that we have that we don't expect to do much. It's just like, we like this song. So don't expect it to become some fan favorite, you know, a song like uh, the better Ash the dust EP is a great example of that. Um, you know, songs like um, no tolerance. It's a song that's like, Oh, we like, we like this. We like the aggression that, that it has and the feeling that it has. We do not expect at all for people to be like, that's my favorite stick to your gun song. But on the same EP, the song Better Ash Than Dust, I think maybe we thought that that song would become like a staple stick to your gun song. And when we play it live, it's cool, but no one's ever like, you gotta play Better Ash Than Dust. Mm-hmm, so right. maybe that maybe that would be the song that I, that I had the most, um, I, I expected the most from that felt like it kind of under, under delivered. Right. Cause I, I love, I, I absolutely love that song. You know, I'm a, I'm a fan of that, that entire EP. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really, really great. I think my personal one that I, I don't think I shared with any of the, of the other guys, I might've shared it with Jesse, but um, I think nothing you can do to me is like severely underestimated off of disobedient. Oh, awesome. So it's also, it's also interesting because Certain songs, like, for example, Nothing You Can Do To Me and Married To The Noise, Mm -hmm. both of those throughout Europe are like, those are equivalent to the Stick To Your Guns, to the Stick To Your Guns fans, those songs are equivalent to We Still Believe and Nobody and Against Them All. 
But in the States or North America, when we go to play Married to the Noise, or it's kind of more like a wet fart, you know, or like nothing you could do to me. It's kind of like, yeah, all right. And some people are in, some people are in on it, but a lot of people are just like, okay, let's just wait for the next one. You know, so it is, it's, it's just like how if we play This Is More in North America, it's going to pop off most likely and going to be awesome. If we go play it in Europe, Sorry, the man's here. Sorry, what was oh, that? Hold on one hold on one second. No, you're good. Yeah. Did someone Thanks. deliver something to you? Is this you're doing? Uh, it might be. A can of light whipped cream. Mm-hmm. A bottle of organic, clean, grass-fed protein. Okay. What's the main course, if there is one? It appears to be your standard pumpkin pie. Looks a little something like this. It sure does. <laughs> sure does. So are you uh, surprised or, or do you need some context as to what's happening here? I, I would love for you to explain. I mean, I think I have an idea, <laughs> but I would love for you to explain to me so, why a pumpkin pie, a large can of whipped cream and a protein shake was just delivered to my house. Well, th th those extra bits are, are outside of what I was doing. So uh, I need to shout out um, to our, our correspondent um, who set all this up, but as a Canadian, I could give a fuck about American Thanksgiving. I almost think it's most Americans. Weird. Most Americans could give a fuck about American true, Thanksgiving. True, very true. I also think it's a little weird that you guys like think it's. I I find Americans that are like, why is Canadian Thanksgiving two months before Christmas? It's like because we like to spread it out. You know, we have like the leftovers and we spread it out. So makes but sense. The only thing growing up that I really cared about American Thanksgiving was seeing you um, essentially one shot a pie in under a minute. Um, pumpkin pie is like my favorite dessert of all time. Like I would have my mom make like uh, a pumpkin pie as my birthday cake for multiple years growing up. Oh, that's, so, that's a solid birthday cake. Yeah. So um, I know you conquered this challenge in, uh, in 2018. Um, so I'm not, so first, I just want to ask the origin as to why that, why you wanted to, <clears throat> I guess, tackle such a feat. Um, but I also thought it would be cool if we could just, you know, eat pie together. If that. Oh yes, that. I, I'm very relieved that you're not trying to get me to eat this whole fucker right now <laughs> in under sixty seconds. No, um, no, I I would I would only desire that if I could be there in person. But you know, maybe that's a something in the future that we can do once our paths um, cross. So Stick Your Guns is on tour one year. I believe we had van troubles. That's then causing us to be uh, late for the show. Mm -hmm. And we stop at a grocery. We're, we're about, everyone's starving. So we're going to pull over to a grocery store. And I said something along the lines of, oh, man, it's around Thanksgiving. I wonder if they have pumpkin pies. I'm so hungry. I love pumpkin pie. I bet I can eat a whole pumpkin pie in under two minutes. And then my friends fucking with me said, anybody can eat a pumpkin pie under two minutes. And I went, well, I bet I can eat one in 60 seconds. And then we pull, so immediately we pull over to the grocery store, we buy a pumpkin pie, we go to the van and I start shoving it into my mouth and I nearly choke to death. And I do not, <laughs> I do not conquer it in 60 seconds. We all have a good laugh and um, we go on about, you know, to play the show. The following year comes around. Wait, what? It's when now, was the first year that that uh, the idea entered your mind. This is twenty. Because you I did this for like almost. I think half a I, I I think I could be wrong. I think the first year was twenty twelve. Oh, okay. So that's very. And then and then twenty thirteen, Thanksgiving again. We're on tour, and. Was either 2012 or 2013 was the first one. And 
So the first one is in a parking lot in the middle of nowhere, America, and it goes horribly wrong. The second one is at Chris's house. We have Thanksgiving day off. He lives in Windsor, Ontario, yeah. but it's like, oh, let's have Thanksgiving. Chris goes, I'll go and buy all the food and I'm going to we'll cook it at my house and I'll make sure to get you a pumpkin pie. Chris is a well-known bastard and he comes back with this pumpkin pie that's as thick as a brick. And he's trying to say that your standard like eight or nine inch pie isn't, that's a small pie. So he has this fucker that's like the size of a pizza and it's this thick. And they're like, yeah, eat it in a minute. And I literally almost choked to death. Like I, was like, <laughs> and they're, like, I was like, oh, this is how I go out. All my friends pointing and laughing at me. This yeah. sounds about right. And um, so I don't make it that year. Um, the next year, I think at this point, I think maybe the first two years I wasn't allowed to have liquid mm. to like try to chase it. Then they were like, okay, you can do liquid. So then like the, the next year, there was one year where like my friends tried to like convince me to like dip each slice and like eat <laughs> kind of like the hot dog guy. Was right. the Japanese guy with the hot dogs? Like how he dips the hot dogs in water and then sucks up. But like, yeah, I just did just took the pumpkin pie and tea. So now it's becoming a bit for people just to fuck with me. Right. And um, and then I think it's 2017. Uh my wife and I got married um in, in August of 2017. Fast forward a couple months later, we're on tour in Europe. This is a testament to how how much of an amazing woman she is. He went to the grocery store here in LA because you can't find a pumpkin pie in Europe. And she carried a pumpkin pie onto a plane and kept it in her lap and flew from LA to Berlin to bring me a pumpkin pie to try to do this challenge. And I think she was really like, I'll do this in hopes that this, this is the this year is the he does last it. Time. <laughs> and we don't ever have to do it. And, uh, and so I came very close that year. Um, and then the following year is when I actually completed it and her and a very few um, amount of my friends were very, very relieved that I could retire from that. And then other people were very angry at me and still, still to this day um, around Thanksgiving, people will um, either send me like hateful DMs like oh wow like like you pussy do it again <laughs> you know or or they're like i'm so disappointed you didn't do the pumpkin pie challenge this year and i'm like i could play it in 2018 <laughs> you know there's video evidence watch it i feel so, like yeah i feel like anyone who's uh, all you know i think all good things have to come to an end at some point i thoroughly enjoyed all of all Absolutely. of it i you know and especially prepping for this episode i i watched back a, a couple of the the highlights from from past years but like if anyone's going to criticize or, or give grief to josh i think you gotta shovel a pie in your in your mouth yeah un under 60 do you want to try it to see what it feels like um if we didn't have so much else to get to in the episode like that's a, that's a great that's a great way to get out of this <laughs> yes yes i i will say we can't have the, we can't have this episode be 60 seconds longer <laughs> No, I'm just fucking with you. I, I I'll I'll say this because I like to leave little, like, mini manifestations, if you want to call it that. If we ever get to cross paths, I'll I'll do it with you side by side. I like that. All right, brothers in arms. Sounds good. Sounds good. Do you want to cheers me on a little pie? Oh yeah, for sure. Let me get a fork. Actually, yeah. I don't need a fork. I have fingers. Yeah, dude, Browse, this is a nice pumpkin pie. <laughs> Let me tell you, the, the other thing that I'm the most interested in is I was like, huh. I was like, how'd you get my address? <laughs> my, like, my correspondent, I was like, it's probably better if you do it versus Jesse or Josh being like, do you have my address now? <laughs> to, to how send me did a pie? that happen? I mean, I'm not mad at it. I guess if anybody has my address, that's what I would prefer to have sent to me. Yeah. Burn. If you want some pumpkin pie, one just, was just delivered. Cheers. The first ever pie check on the Scope Explosion podcast. All right. Pie check, way better than bev check. 
You think? Make everybody make everybody show up with a slice of pie. <laughs> I like that. Not even a so slice. Put, the whole the whole thing. The whole thing. You got to eat the whole thing during the interview. I like that. Is pumpkin pie the the go to for you, or is it just you you only mm. did it because it was um the no season no the season pumpkin pie is like super nostalgic to me. Mm-hmm. Um, growing up, anytime we didn't really do that many family like vacations other than going to my grandma's house in South Carolina, mm-hmm. and um, she uh, my mom grew up on a on a tobacco farm in South Carolina, and that's where we would go back to. And my grandma had a pumpkin patch and she would make pumpkin pies year round. And, but it was really, it was really interesting. Her pumpkin pies were like bright orange. And I later, and I later found out like the recipe and I tried it and there's like a lot of like lemon that's involved in it and stuff like that. And everything that like makes a standard pumpkin pie, like kind of brown, she didn't use so for years, I didn't like this kind of pumpkin pie. I was like, oh, this tastes okay. weird to me. But I could never see, I could never find my, my grandma's pumpkin pie anywhere, obviously. Um, but so that was like always my favorite pie growing up as a child. I didn't give a fuck about cherry or apple or blueberry or anything like that. Now, as an adult, I, I, I love all types of pies. But I would say pumpkin pie is probably still my favorite. That and then that lemon meringue. And uh, like coconut key lime, oh, I would say okay. I would say those are my top three. But I think pumpkin pie I'll just it's always been there for me, you know. Yeah, I just I just feel it. it it's the one thing that does the mo- like the most with the least, you know. Like obviously, there's different spices and shit that you can do, but there's no fucking like totally. you know c- bake crust crust on anything. top. No, yeah, no. I agree. I agree. Just some yeah. good old pumpkin guts. This is a great, this is a great pie. Mm-hmm. Anyone in Los Angeles looking for a good pumpkin pie, go to Sprouts. <laughs> it's funny too, because I was just like intentionally leaving dead air in the episode because it's just like, I kind of want to do this more with my guests. It's just like order food and just fucking, like, I'm, I am i don't know about the, the audio listeners if they like that because it's just us smacking um yeah there's just a dog little... barking and someone yeah i i was i was not sure this also to, to just for the record this happened a little bit earlier than i was expecting in the episode because um we don't like we have like things like uber eats and things like that but we don't have like postmates for like oh i need yeah. this one thing at the grocery store so i i had no idea how long it was gonna take but um it was quick that guy apparently seems to be very on it Okay. Also, what was in, what was insane is when I opened the door, he was already off my property, getting into his car. So it felt like he sprinted away yeah, yeah. as soon as knocking on the door. So yeah, yeah. he's he's busting ass today. Yeah. Um. So I want to talk about um. You know, I I mentioned at the top of the episode a few of the bands that you're in, but I got to talk about the most important one. Um. Talk. Let's talk about Sorry Fern. Um, <laughs> the coolest demo that came out of the pandemic. Um, but also like, um, the fact that you guys, like, it was always a question mark of like, would there ever be a show and things like that? And then it just like spontaneously happened while stick to your guns was, uh, over in Europe. So, uh, let's go to the very beginning, like, and talk to me about the origin and like how the idea of like Fern singing on shit came together. Um, so during the pandemic, uh, like when it was first, like two weeks locked down, like where everyone's like, well, what the fuck is going on? Um, we mostly just stayed at our apartment, but every day I would go over to, uh, my friend's house who he was just sitting at his house. And it was like, he had, a, he had like a, a, a decent backyard and we're like, Oh, we'll, we'll work out every day. Mm-hmm. We have nothing else to do. Well, get to hang out. I'll get out of my space. Also at the time, my wife and I were like in a super tiny apartment. So it's probably just great to, you know, to be like, okay, you can have some alone time and I'll go over to, to my friend's house. And when I, we were working out one day, some like dumb joke happened that was, um, 
uh, very offensive. I, I can't, I'm not going to reveal what it was, but, uh, and so I was, I was just sitting around. I was like, Oh, you know, it'd be funny is if I turn that joke into, um, a song, just a three second, like, like riff. And I was like, well, I was like, I'm going to get Fern to yell. Um, I am a rabbit on it. And so she's like, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And I was like, come on. I was like, just don't be embarrassed. Just go for it. And then, so I, you know, the riff was just like, da -na 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 -na. and it was like, I am a rabbit. That's all it was. And she yelled it. And then I was like, whoa, that sounded cool. And then she's like, you're fucking with me. Don't fuck with me. I was like, no, that actually sounded cool. And then after a couple of days, I was like, oh, we're not doing shit. I'm just going to write some songs and see, see if she will actually sing on it. Mm -hmm. And it took a little bit convincing. Um, and then, you know, from then on, it was like, all right, go get in the bathtub. And, and I, I am like, not someone who is, uh, super like well-versed in recording or like technology, everything. So everything was done like for sure in a laughable way, just on, on my laptop through, through logic. And, um, and so she's just in a bathtub and she has a pair of headphones on. And she's like, I can't really hear the music. And I'm like, I don't really know how to make it louder. So you just got to like, you know, go for it. And, and I remember like after she, she tracked the first couple of songs, the next day she was like, oh man, my shoulder hurts. And I was like, why, why does your shoulder hurt? Do you sleep on it wrong? She's like, I don't think so. I'm like, oh, whatever. So conversation just fades away and then um a day or so goes by and we start doing more songs and i peek over into the bathtub and she's just like like <laughs> bracing her arms so hard behind her like a screamo singer from like 1998 and i was like that's why your fucking shoulder hurts you're about to break your own shoulder and um it was really cool you know and and, and i think like in the beginning it definitely was like I said, something just to make a friend laugh. But then she was like, Hey, I have these lyrics. And like, I, th I thought about, like I wrote lyrics to, I am a rabbit. And it's about being an immigrant and all this stuff. And I was like, Whoa, this is cool. And so she started, she wrote um, some of the lyrics on that, on that demo, all the good ones she wrote. And, uh, and then I was like, man, this is really cool. And then, you know, we put out the tape and, um, and, and that and was she, really fun. And she has like no prior band experience other than like maybe seeing shit that you were doing. Yeah. Other, other be her. Yeah. She, she had never been in a band. She doesn't play any instruments. She's never she's played not, a show. Never played a show. None of those things. So, right. which was also really cool because it's been such a long time since I, I had made music with someone who was like, overly excited about it because it was a brand new experience you know it's like being this far into into my life playing bands for more than half of my life now it's like all right we know exactly what to do like you do this you do this the breakdown's about to come what if you do this you know and everything's just kind of like you know everybody has extreme confidence but also everybody is um very like uh it's just kind of like going through the, the motions, you know, but with her, it was like the excitement of whenever you're 15 and you first make your first band yeah. and it's like, ah, sure. you know, and it doesn't matter if it's good or if it's bad. It's just like, this feels fun. So yeah. So that was kind of like the origin of it. And I think that we would have, if it would have been a regular year, I think we would have probably for sure try to like just start playing shows right away. But you know, that was like in 2020, like I said, we did the tape um, and to our surprise, like sold out the tapes really fast, sold a bunch of t-shirts. We took all the money to this, there's this thing called LA Community Fridges that there's these like fridges pretty much around town that anybody can stock with food. And then um, homeless people or anyone that's even in just in need of food can go there and just pick up free food. So we just took the money and stock all the fridges in our neighborhood for a couple of months, which was cool. And, uh, yeah. And then, um, you know, fast forward to last summer, she came out to, she came out on tour with us for like 10 days in Europe. And then, um, one of the days, one of the guys in the six year guns was like, when's there ever going to be a sorry fern show? 
And, you know, she got like real shy about it. And she's like, I don't know. And then everyone was like, you know, and Andrew and, and Adam were like, we'll just learn the songs and we'll, we'll just play a set on one of the, one of these shows. And then she was like, what? Are you guys serious? And we're like, yeah. So we were playing. It's like, welcome to hardcore. Show. We do shit like this. on the Exactly. Play. Yeah. It was really cool. And we were playing this like, um, you know, small city in, in, I think it was Germany. And, you know, it's this little sold out show, like, you know, 500 kids, something like that. And uh, what we did was um, in the middle of the Stick to Your Gun set, he came out and we did two songs. And I was like, it was so funny because beforehand, um, she was like, hey, what, what do I, what should I say when I go out there? And I go, I go, that's the beauty of it. You say whatever you want. Mm-hmm. I go, or you don't say anything. It's just all up to like how you're feeling and, and what you want to express or what you don't want to express. You can get up there and be dead silent. You can get up there and do a five minute speech if you want, mm-hmm. you know, and that's one of the, the coolest things about like punk and hardcore and, and underground music is that there really are no rules to the, to the live performance. And um, it was interesting because in her career, I think there's a lot of like um, mental prepping and getting like in a zone. And I know that some musicians are for sure like that. Usually if you were to go onto a backstage and stick to your gun show, it's like three minutes before Jesse's like laying on the floor, eating some candy, you know, like Chris is, Chris is like taking a nap. I'm sitting there fucking around. Andrew's playing a video game. Adam's the only like real musician. Yeah, he's on he's his like, pad. He's like warming yeah, up yeah, and yeah. like preparing himself. <laughs> but everybody else is like, oh, we're playing. Okay, let's go. And then we just walk out and do it. But it was it was funny before before Sorry for him playing. I saw her like in the backstage, like zoning in. And I was like, whoa, this is gonna be interesting. Yeah. And she walked out and she was just like, Let's fucking go. And we started to send kids started stage diving and shit. I was like, oh my God. And she killed it. It was really cool. And and um she's been she's been she's she has brought it up uh you know ever since we did the first demo. Like, hey, whenever you have time, if you write any more songs, like I'd love to do it again. And so um this past this past uh New Year's, um, we left town for a few days and went out into into the desert and wrote like seven more songs okay. and uh so just gotta have Sorry gotta have to come and see yeah adam's gonna put drums on it and you know right now super like focused on the next stick to your guns record mm. but once that's done um i think we'll i think we'll do another another little ep or something and maybe play a show uh you know in in la somewhere or something like that it'd be, do you it'd think be it was less stressful well, obviously it was stressful for her regardless, like just doing the show in general um, based off like, you know, no prior experiences. But do you think it would it was maybe like it would be more stressful to do something on like home turf, so to speak, where it's like, oh, my friends could come to the show and, and see me you know, oh, doing this versus like I, a bunch I of can see her. that I'll never see again. <laughs> Totally. I could, I could see her definitely being like, uh, like, Oh wait, fuck, wait, we're going to do a show here. Like my friends can come and watch. I don't know if I really want this, you know, but, um, right. but she's also, you know, like he's, she's a performer. So I'm sure she can just tap into it. And on top of that, it's like, you know, like it's, she enjoys it, you know? So I think more than that and she's, and she's aware. And I think really does appreciate that that is like an outlet that could be there for her if she wanted. So hopefully she'll just own it. But it is funny because I fuck with her. And I'm like, dude, I wish my first band, I could make a few hundred tapes and it would sell out in a day. I wish my first show was a sold out show and people were stage diving and singing along and jumping around. I'm like, must be nice, you know? <laughs> but I like to fuck yeah. with her about that. Yeah. No, it it is just very, very cool just to see um, just like it, exactly how you're saying how someone ha- is having that like first time experience. Like I've started bands in the last couple of years with people who didn't have who were who like 10 years younger than me. But it was just for them to have that like newer experience of like getting to see a, a, a set like a crowd explode when a certain part hits. And it's like, 
whoa, did you see what happened there? It's like, yeah, that's fucking awesome. Yeah. So. And I think what's really cool about that is like, it doesn't matter what age that happens. Mm-hmm. If you're 15 and you experience that, or if you're 35 and experience that, it's such a powerful thing to, to witness and to feel inside the room yeah. that it's almost like that same type of, of reaction and feeling, which is, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to quickly circle back uh, to some stig stuff. And then I have a couple of just like random, like um, ran, random things to hit you with. So uh, a very iconic stick to your guns, um, video you know you guys have done a few different um you know performances where it's like all acoustic you've done actual acoustic versions of different songs um you've done like an acoustic tour um but my favorite is jesse on your shoulders at program and him like almost holding the acoustic guitar on your head um was there a specific reason why you wanted to i guess like hoist him up that way <laughs> or if no, that so, was the one and only time that happened so that was um in 2017 when true view was coming out we did a bunch of just kind of different or unique things for the release of that record like uh there was one day in orange county where you could go and get um $50 stick to your guns tattoos and there's all like these artists made different it wasn't like you got stick to your guns tattooed on you, but it was right. like, you know, tattoos inspired by lyrics or whatever. And just, just like small a little, sheet or something. Right, like right. Little yeah. small things. And so we all, all of us went down, everyone got tattooed except for Chris. Um, Cause he, he believes that his body is this little holy virgin temple. <laughs> now I'm fucking it. Uh, he just doesn't have any tattoos. And uh, <clears throat> so like one day it was like, Come get a stick tattoo. One day we did a uh, a collaboration in San Diego with this um, coffee company, and Jesse did acoustic songs, and it was like a coffee type thing. Which again, as you can see, how funny that is for me that I don't like the coffee. And then, um, and then another thing we did was just an acoustic. It was just essentially like a a meet and greet type thing at program, and then Jesse played um, songs acoustically. Mm-hmm. A lot of people turned up to the uh program thing and jesse started and people like couldn't see and then like there wasn't a chair for him to stand on or anything and it was like you could kind of tell that there were kids that were like oh damn i drove an hour for this and i can't see shit you know because there's no stage or anything like that so i was just like ah oh, fuck it just get on my shoulders <laughs> and so he just got on my shoulders and finished the rest of the set like that and i think it was only Luckily for my body, it was only like three or four songs, um, right. but it was, it was also the, 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 the funniest part about it was obviously it was funny when it was happening, but then he starts playing these songs. And I'm like, Oh, these songs are so serious. I can't be <laughs> laughing. So I'm just kind of like looking down, trying to be like straight faced, mm-hmm. you know, but also like my body starting to shake. Cause it's been nine <laughs> minutes and I've had 200 pounds sitting on my shoulder. So, right. um, did but you, yeah, did that's, you, that's all did that you was. feel like people were looking at you directly or like just like at your head because that's where well, Jesse was? Or were they yeah, the one in between? It was in between, which then made me feel awkward. So then I'm just kind of trying to look at the ground. <laughs> and then I was like, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it was, you, it was fun. Have, have, you haven't done that any other time, though. That was the one and only No, no, yeah. yeah. I'm not like, I'm not like amped up to try to throw him over my shoulder so he can play a set. <laughs> Next time they'd be like, let's get this guy a couple chairs. Right. You know? yeah. 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 But it is cool that, you know, you, I, I wasn't sure if, it, if you caught it or it was like, you know, the promoter or someone was kind of, or you were just hearing murmurings and then you're like, well, it's hardcore and just put them on. Them on my yeah. Back. That's, that's mostly what it was. I was like, ah, these people are bummed. They can't see. Here's a, here's a solution. Yeah. I am the solution. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. we are. Yeah. Um, and kind of like just tangenting off of that, I know that you're like very big into, um, you know, working out, you've done like multiple little, little, like not even interviews, but just little featurettes where it's like, yeah, this is the shit I do while I'm out on the road. Um, yeah. For the people that are listening that are maybe, you know, wanting to get a little bit more swole this year. Um, what's kind of like a recent, 
um, workout hat that you've been doing uh, while being on tour, especially over the last couple of months here? Um, honestly, I think just like if you're out on tour and traveling, simplicity and um, consistency is key. And really, you can go a long way with just doing push-ups and air squats. And if you got a kettlebell, that. I used to bring out, like, there used to be that lived in the trailer, like an entire, like, squat rack and bench and, like, 500 pounds worth of weight and all this shit. And that was really awesome because it would help me um, stay on track of whatever program I was doing at the time. Mm -hmm. But... Slowly over the years, it just became more and more like physically harder to do that on tour and also drive an eight hour shift and only sleep for four hours and play a show. And then there's also like it's, a, you know, a blizzard outside or it's raining or whatever it is. So now I just try to keep it like as, as simple as possible. Bring, you know, one or two kettlebells. And uh, I, have, I have a kettlebell that um, stays in Europe with my, my guitar and our backline stuff. Right. So every time we're over there, but yeah, it's, I think it's just about finding out whatever your goal is and then just finding a simple, easy way. And then also, I mean, the biggest thing is just is sadly is diet, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like, it's no so easy for me to, on the road. No, it's so, it's so easy for me to be like an extreme fat fuck. Um, and just like, you know, like it's so hard for me not to just, stuck down this entire pie right now but i'm like okay <laughs> just moderation you know um and also on top of that like i had uh i had a uh, neck surgery in 20 what year are we in 2022 i had neck surgery so that also like threw me off pretty hard with you know, being able to like even exercise and stuff for like a year. Or so right. I feel like I'm just now getting back to the point where I'm starting to feel like, like my old self again. Yeah. How long did you have that neck brace on? Cause you did multiple tours with it. It looked like. Yeah. Um, it all happened the day before we started an eight week tour. <laughs> so <laughs> I was fucking neck brace on for eight weeks, which I never watched it which was hilarious what? um and that and now it's it's now it's now it's wrapped up in a plastic bag on top of our washing machine um <laughs> uh but yeah i think it was i think it was that tour and then there was one other tour so i mean it was probably a total of like 10 weeks of shows mm -hmm. which was which was a lot and then i kind of got the green light to be able to like not wear a neck brace, but don't really move. Mm. And that was the, I think that was the hardest thing for me was playing and not being able to like, I'm just kind of sitting Every there. Every night's a try not to headbang challenge for you. Yeah. And I'd be, I'd become like, you know, what I hated most. I, I always hated going to shows and not seeing people move around. I was like, no, look at me. I'm <laughs> one of those people, you know? So it was funny the neck the neck brace people thought it was like uh because that was like our first big tour after the pandemic they thought that that was like my bit like oh yeah oh yeah now I'm gonna be the guy that wears a neck brace <laughs> and I'm like what kind of fucking bit is that as if I was gonna be like I'm gonna paint my face right. or like now I'm gonna wear a leather jacket. It's like, oh, I'm going to wear a neck brace. Only wear viper glasses for the rest of this band's existence. It's, exactly. I was yeah. like, yeah, that's that's my bit now. Mm -hmm. The neck brace. Yeah. Um, jumping back to the, the workout shit. Um, I've seen you, when you post just like random little things about the gym, it seems like you're constantly mentioning that you get sunburned. Do you get sunburned easy? Or is that something that you seek out? Yeah, I'm just like a big fan of like getting burnt by the sun as bad as I can. No, I mean, I don't feel like I get sunburned often, mm -hmm. but maybe, maybe every time it happens, I think it's funny. So that's why I say something about it. So it seems like a lot, but I don't get sunburned too often. But when I do get sunburned, it's usually bad. Mm, you're like a, so, a red tomato. Like you're Bob. The yeah. Tomato. Yeah, but that's but but legitimately, I know we might disagree on this. I feel like it only happens like once every few years. 
Okay. I mean, it's, it's so, your body. It's so your sin, shocking. <laughs> it's my body, my choice. Yeah. My choice to get sunburned. It's and then post choice. about it for all, all the people that follow me on social media. I just don't know anyone else who's no. just like mentioned it as many times as I saw. I was like, there's, there's a common thread here. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's funny <laughs> whenever, whenever it's like one part of you is so bright white and one part of you is so red. Mm-hmm. That's funny. <laughs> so th- I guess that's why I post it or that, or I'm extremely bored. Yeah. It could be that too. Um, why is Terminator mm. 2 one of the only things that matter in life? Mm, I mean, it really, it is not only the greatest action movie made, but when you really break it down, I mean, it is, that movie's an existential crisis. It gives you all your answers about uh, finding um, purpose and love and how you can you can change it's everything it's got comedy it's got drama it's some would say it's got some romance um i'm uh it's got uh, uh you know the, the concept in um commentary on family structure it's got violence and it's got bad words and uh yeah it's just it's got i think that movie's I think that movie's un, unfuckable, um, unfuckable with, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I know. I just, I love it. Would you say and a lot of people, and a lot of people, I think like go, Oh, Terminator two. And they think that that's like equivalent to like fast and the furious four or like, a, <laughs> or like, or like a Marvel movie. And then I go, well, you just haven't watched the movie, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Would you would you say, T? Because I know that you're not a fan of anything Star Wars. Would you say T two like is would knock any Star Wars movie out of the water? Yes, but <laughs> I'm also I'm also aware that the story of Star Wars is an unbelievable epic that Absolutely. also that also touches on all those things. Um, for me. Uh, you know, and maybe it's time that I give Star Wars another chance. The last one that I saw is uh, the one with Jar Jar Binks, because mm-hmm. that came out on my birthday, and I skipped school. I mean, my friends went and saw it, and I was thought it was so bad and boring that I fell asleep in the theater, which is not something that typically happens. Uh, so maybe it's a time. Maybe it's time that I give Star Wars another chance. Um, I'm not going to knock on anyone that loves Star Wars. I think it makes sense. I have more respect for Star Wars than I do for Avengers or okay. or most m- current Marvel stuff. But, you know, everybody's got their own thing. Everybody connects to something differently. For me, it's fucking Arnold. Yeah. Do you do you have equal appreciation to other Terminator movies, or is it kind of like... No, T2 is is far beyond superior. Mm. I, Ter- I, Terminator, I have to agree with but, you there. Because it, it's I look at it the same way as that, like, there's Star Wars A New Hope that introduces this universe, and then there's Empire Strikes Back that's, like, the antithesis of all Star Wars things. And I think it's... Yeah, like, I, I would imagine... Yeah, I would imagine for a Star Wars fan, there's way more good Star Wars than there are bad. That is the opposite in the Terminator franchise. <laughs> yeah. There's Unfortunately, yeah. One, there is one phenomenal Terminator. There's one good one. There's maybe a couple okay ones, and then there's a handful of bad ones. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to be honest. I'm not a I'm not a Terminator franchise apologist. <laughs> you know, I think I'm very realistic. Yeah. Where Where does T two rank in like top movies for you? Is it Does it hold? Oh, up it's in my up? It's in my top five. Top five. Okay. Yeah, I only have I only have a confirmed top four movies, and my fifth one is is a rotation. Oh, okay. But that's not a rotating one. That's a... No, that's in my that's that's in my consistent top 4. Got you. Got you. 
Okay. Um, that's exciting. Um, one of the last <laughs> things uh, I'll hit you with, Josh, is um, I, wait, 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 wait. I want to ask you this. Yeah, sure. Are you, you're a Terminator fan. A hundred percent. B two or all? So I think, I think a top three for Terminators is T two, the first one. And then I have a weird love for um, Terminator Salvation, the one that's kind of like more of a, I guess it's a prequel or or it's is that before or after who's who's in that one? Is it Sam? Was it Sam Worthington or Joel Egerton that was in it? In, uh, in let me pull that up for you, um, Sam Worthington. Ah, yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I do plan uh, whenever I have some free time, I want to give them all a complete rewatch because other than T1 and T2, all the other ones, I think I've only seen one time. And yeah. the one viewing, I was like, yep, that was bad. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, I, I really did have high hopes for Dark Fate, the one that came out a few years ago. Oh, uh, when they kind of like brought Arnold back, not CGI Arnold, which was in the... Yeah. Movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um, and I remember thinking like, oh, there's a lot of good potential here. And there were some cool scenes, but overall for the whole movie, it was just kind of, kind of whatever. I, I think, I think the, the reason that I like salvation or give it more kudos, it, there's definitely, it's not a perfect movie by any means, but I think something that's lacking in the first couple movies is just the, you only see like snippets of like the Terminators, like, I guess capabilities of like destruction and all their tech and all that. So I, I feel like salvation kind of like open, you know, there's different types of like, um, there's like, there's different, um, like almost like vehicles and different things that are used to hunt down the humans. So that was interesting to me where it kind of expanded the, the universe a little bit more. Um, yeah, but every versus like any weird character arts or, or story decisions, but I feel like it's, it's good, not great. T two is great, uh, amazing. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes. What's your favorite movie? You're gonna hit me with favorite movie or your top? Get what's like a top. Rock, what's my Mount Rushmore of movies? Yeah, like a top five. Okay. Um, off the cuff. Back to the Future two. Great. I have a flux capacitor tattooed on my wrist. And that's insane. Tattooed on the day they go into the future. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, Sorry, okay. I'm flexing I, a I little bit you. of the back. I, under, the I understand your love for that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think a fantastically underrated mo movie that I always rewatch is. Uh, Inside Man, if you've seen that before. Yeah, with Clive Owen. Mm -hmm. I just feel mm -hmm. like it's... Like, I only know like a few pocket of people that are like, oh, dude, that movie is fantastic. So yeah, that's that's up there. Um, I think like... I think... I think Star Wars episode... I think five... That's the one with Jar Jar Binks. No, no, that that's episode one. <laughs> I I just think when I was growing up, um, I grew up in Winnipeg, and so like when it was like freezing cold all the time, I just related that to like, oh, it's like living on Hoth, which is like the first planet where they kind of fight around. Yeah. Um. Two more. Can I do? We're just doing movies, no shows or or anything of that. No, nature. that's a that's a whole different list. That's true. That's true. You put me on the spot. I'm so. We, not... we can leave it at a, we can leave it at a top three. All right, I'll leave it at top three, and and okay. I'll also say you know I should have, I should have my top five ready. Do you have your top five? I know my my top four are um, in no particular order. Terminator 2, mm -hmm. Jaws, Part 1, Cinema Paradiso, and True Romance. Okay. 
but my like revolving five is like uh, unforgiven. Uh, you know, I don't know. There's just so many. There's there's too many to give that that number fifth to number right. five to. Yeah, I I I find it's it's e it's harder or more appropriate to do like yeah like a top four because top it's the fifth slot that always is yeah always tripped up. Yeah, but and it's also like it's hard to figure out why you're. Is it about like rewatchability? Is it about like nostalgic reasons? Is it about mm-hmm. because it has the most emotional impact or whatever? But anyway, those are my four for sure. Yeah. I'll take I'll take I'll take those four to the grave. I feel good okay. about that. Sounds great. Um, well, Josh, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Uh, I felt like we've hit on a lot of really great great stuff. Uh, we've ate some pie. We've checked some bevs. Um, the very last thing that I yeah. ask every single guest uh, before we get out of here is a favorite mosh related story um, that you would like to hit on. So that's anything funny, wholesome, gruesome, uh, could have happened to you or stick show or not, uh, whatever's first to your head. Um, <clears throat> in the early 2000s is whenever it became like really popular to have outlandish mosh calls. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so like the breakdown would be building up and someone would be like, make like a cow and move or whatever. <laughs> and Evergreen is playing a show. And there's a song that we had called No Donnie, These Men Are Nihilist. And at the end of the song, the song stops. And then there was usually a mosh call. And then it would go into the last breakdown. And our singer was very unpredictable. And he said, and it's not even that good or funny or anything, but at the at that at that time, moshing was also referred to was mostly referred to as hardcore dancing, mm-hmm. or people would be like pit ninjas, right. and it's very very embarrassing um, vocabulary. And he said, "Fight those invisible ninjas," and then the breakdown started, and we're all like, "Ha ha!" Had a little laugh, and then six months later, we go back to that town. And this guy walks up to him and he goes, hey, man, I saw you guys last time. Fucking loved it. Check this out. Takes his shirt off and across his back, tattooed, only thing on his back, fight those invisible ninjas. And we were like, what? (laughs) Why would you do that? Like in the boldest no, of lettering, anyone, anyone who sees that will be like, "What is the context of this?" And anyway, that was always something that was just fucking hilarious to me. It just killed me. Did he? Did he elaborate that he saw you guys, heard that mosh call, had a out of body experience, and then called up his tattoo artist was like, "I need to come see you." Age. I think he was just, I think he was literally a slight man out of badass. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just like, whoa, this is, this is insane. You know? That- Cause it's also like every band that I've been in or whatever has always had like a, um, a love for just like bad jokes mm-hmm. and just to try to, you know, tell them something, you know, dad jokes or just bad shit. And that was for sure falling in line with that. Oh, for sure. So to us, it was funny. We also recognized that, like on the outside, be like, "Oh my god, that's so cheesy and corny." The guy said that, but he wasn't saying it for anyone else. He was saying it for us. And the fact that one guy heard it was like, "Dude, fucking badass, man! <laughs> I gotta get that tattooed across my back." I was like, "Respect. This guy doesn't give a fuck what anybody thinks." Damn that. I mean, you know. If I had a running list of all the wild shit that I've heard as mosh calls, and it's like, who who wants, who who needs an inspirational tattoo to put across their chest? It's not that one. It's not that one. Oh, here's here's. I'll give you one more, please. Uh, Evergreen is playing outside of Atlanta. This has got to be I don't know, two thousand two thousand one, and at this time. Um, a lot of shocking things would happen at shows. Um, and we're playing and we're playing kind of like a, a VFW hall type thing. And uh, 
we're playing the show and then everything's going great. And then all of a sudden the crowd parts and this kid comes running up like into the middle of the pit. Everybody kind of gets away from him. So it's just him. He has, he's, oh, the only thing that he's wearing is a G string that is a, uh, looks like a tuxedo. And it's like the so front it's black and white or yeah, no, but it had, it had like a bow tie and buttons. Like it was like <laughs> supposed to actually look like a tuxedo. So okay. it was like a thong. And then the front, you know, covering all of his shit is like a little miniature tuxedo. And he pulls it to wow. the side. He pulls it to the side, exposing all of his goods. And then he douses his dick and balls with lighter fluid and then lights his Get on fire and he had lighter fluid had gotten also on his chest and stomach so his balls and dick are in flames <laughs> and then it just runs up his stomach and his chest like to his face and we're still playing <laughs> you know and, and then like people start washing and then he's he's patting it hitting himself, but the flames are just getting bigger. This kid is burning alive in front of everyone. And then our friend Lars runs out of, there's like a kitchen because like a VFW hall. He runs out of there with like a five gallon tub of um, uh, Neapolitan ice cream <laughs> and then just smothers the kids picking balls in the ice cream and starts rubbing ice cream all over and that's what puts the fire out. Oh my gosh. I don't know so which the, story. Those are the two is that come. Those are the two that come to mind. There's, I, I, I'm sure there's plenty others, but I feel like the, the poll for this uh, podcast episode needs to be which mosh story is better. Um, someone tattooing the most ridiculous mosh call on their back, or someone lighting them their dick and all front of their <laughs> mid mosh. Yeah, yeah, and then. Being saved by ice cream, chocolate, vanilla, and yeah, strawberry. Yeah. You know, what's funny is that's not the first time that moshing with ice cream has been mentioned on the show here. That's very odd. But it makes uh, sense. Most so, people do like ice cream. Uh, I think, to my recollection, my recollection, it was with um, Malachi from Scow was on the show. This was a few years ago, but mentioned that um, Sammy from Drain moshed with ice cream at the show at, at a show that he was booking and, and Malachi was like man I have got to clean this up when this is all over I get out of anyone uh, currently involved in hardcore Sammy from Drain does seem like he would mosh with a couple ice cream cones yeah like <laughs> two step while you know eating a choco taco or something yeah I, I've been so. I've been waiting to have him on the show just to ask him that, but um, <laughs> maybe he'll finally hear it. It's like, okay, I have to, I have to address the uh, the the slippery slide uh, ice cream mosh. Um, Josh, dude, this has been a very fun chat. I knew we were gonna talk about some fun shit, some goofy shit, some serious shit. Um, all the links for all your bands and all that stuff will be in the show notes and the description. Uh, Anything you want to shout out, anything you want to plug, or anything you want to send the people off on? I know that we talked a, l a little before we were going that Stig has some new stuff in the works. But yeah, anything that you can say at this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just say it. Yeah, we're going, we're, we're going to start doing a new record next month. So hopefully we will have something out uh, for by the end of the year. Okay. So and uh, yeah. We'll, we'll be on tour and I think we're really going to try to, to hit it hard, uh, with this, with this record. So, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, all the normal things, just watch it on social media and check it out. And if you like it, then great. And if you don't, then you know, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I am is, is ecstatic to, to think that there's a new Stig record to be had this year and maybe even a new Sorry Fern EP as well, or, you if if y'all just go straight to the lp then that's cool too oh my god yeah I, that might be uh you know what fuck it maybe we'll do that who knows <laughs> yeah I love to i'm gonna focus it. on focus on the new state record and then we'll 
Well, we'll get it started for just for you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I was, I was, I was like, I don't know. I don't want to impose and just be like, oh, could I ask? And then she was like headed to work. So I was like, M- maybe we'll do a Sorry Fern part two interview once the LP comes out with Josh and Fern. I think that'd be fun. Oh, uh, yeah, that'd be fun. That we'll figure be. it out. We'll figure it out. Um, Dude, shall we cheers pies before we sign off? We absolutely should. Let me stick my fingers back in it. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to manhandle this. Cheers. Thanks for coming on, brother. Thanks for the pie.